Hey everybody, what is going on? Greg here with Z21 Learning, and today we're going to take a look at making anime maps inside of Google Earth Pro. Um, it's a little tricky at first, but I think once you kind of get the hang of it uh, and you actually know how the program works, uh, you guys will be making anime maps in no time at all. A couple things I do want to mention. Uh, first, this is going to be a two-part tutorial. Part one, we're primarily going to focus on some of the features of Google Earth. So we'll be talking about things such as adding place marks, uh, keeping your places organized, um, tours, kind of how the program actually works. In part two, we're going to do some mock map requests, and we'll kind of apply the knowledge that we learned in part one and kind of see it in a uh, sort of real-world example. Uh, this isn't going to be an all-inclusive tutorial. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to cover every single feature of Google Earth Pro. There are a number of features that Google Earth Pro does offer that we don't use. Um, so I'm primarily going to touch on the ones that we do tend to use on a regular basis. I am working on a Mac, and you may be working on a PC, so some of the di there may be some differences in terms of searching for things such as preferences between the two programs. Um, but when we come to some of those differences, I'll discuss what you would need to do if you were on a PC as opposed to a Mac. And then last but not least, I am working with a 3D mouse. So occasionally you may see kind of this dot and these arrows show up on my screen. Um, when I actually record out a tour, uh, you'll see these things show up on my screen also, but uh, they won't show up in the final animation. Um, you don't need to have a 3D mouse in order to work inside of Google Earth Pro. Uh, I only have one just because the default mouse that comes with the uh, iMac is kind of lame, so um, <laughs> I usually just go ahead and use my 3D mouse instead. If you are working on a PC, I do recommend working with a two-button mouse that does have a middle scroll wheel. If you press down on the middle scroll wheel, you can use that to pan around inside of your scene. And if you scroll on the scroll wheel front and back, you can actually use it to zoom in and to zoom out. So with that said, um, enough talking, let's go ahead and jump in to Google Earth. So first off, I'm going to talk about the sidebar, and that's this panel over here on the left side of your screen. Sidebars divide up into your search, places, and layers windows here. Search is very basic. You can search for things such as uh, addresses, cities, famous landmarks, streets, uh, things like that. Underneath that, you have places. And places is basically where all of your place marks, your polygons, your paths, your tours, anything that you add and put on the map is going to show up over here under places. Now, as you can see, I've kind of got my places organized into all of these separate folders with uh, different elements inside those folders. The way you create these folders is I just go up to my places and right click on it, go to add, and I'm just going to go ahead and add a folder. And I'm just going to call this uh, tutorial. And I've got this tutorial folder down here. Um, you can also go ahead and add uh, place marks and paths and polygons and stuff via the places over here. Um, the other way you can do this is you can also go up to your toolbar. You also have the same options up here as well. So one of the things I do like about um, having these folders is when you actually need to delete something, you can go ahead and delete not only the folder itself, but you can also keep the folder and just delete all of the contents inside. So maybe you want to have like your own personal folder that you didn't want to delete on a regular basis, but you want to delete everything inside. You just do delete contents and retain your folder. So that kind of comes in handy too. And of course, if you wanted to delete a folder, you could also just go ahead and use the delete key on your keyboard and it gets rid of it. So underneath places, we have layers. And layers are basically uh, different sort of visual elements that you can turn on and off uh, for your map. So in this case, I've got under borders and labels, I've got some of the borders turned on, such as uh, the international border up here, which is a solid uh, yellow line. I've got state borders, which is these uh, purple lines. And then as I zoom in on my map here, you can tell I've got these green lines, and these represent the different counties. I usually work with roads turned on. So these yellow ones, these are typically the highways or the major arteries. Uh, if you zoom in closer on this map, you can see that uh, side streets and residential streets are also highlighted as well. And the nice thing about roads is they do go ahead and give you a label for telling you what exactly the road is. So that comes in handy. Three billions are also pretty handy. These are uh, feature you don't have to have turned on. I usually leave it turned on. It kind of gives you this extra depth and dimension to your map. 
not all the places in the world are actually going to have 3D buildings as an option. So you may have it checked, but when you zoom into your map, everything may look flat. And that's just because Google hasn't gone ahead and made um, you know, all the different cities and all different locations uh, with 3D buildings. And you don't have to have 3D buildings turned on. You can have it turned off. Uh, this is what your map view would look like. Um, with 3D buildings turned on, do keep in mind that this will affect your render time. So if you want a quicker render, I recommend turning off 3D buildings. But if you want to have that extra depth and dimension to your map, then try working with 3D buildings turned on. And then the last thing that I usually work with turned on is terrain. And terrain basically just shows kind of the curvature of the landscape. So you can tell I've kind of zoomed over here to this place by the river and I've got this uh, butte here in the background. I've got some mountains and stuff. Uh, if I didn't have terrain turned on, watch what happens. Google Earth literally gives me a very flat view of the landscape. Uh, I can't tell if this is a butte anymore. I can't tell that, the are, that there are mountains out here. Uh, it honestly looks like we're looking at the prairie or something. So I do recommend having terrain turned on. I just think it kind of adds that extra level of depth and dimension to the map and makes it more interesting and visually appealing to look at. Um, again, like 3D buildings, by having terrain turned on, it will affect your render time, so keep that in mind, but still, I, I think it's worth it. If you're working inside of Google Earth and you find that the sidebar is just a little too uh, big and you don't want to show this, you can also hide it by going up here and pressing the hide sidebar option. And again, if you want to show it, you just press it again. All right, so that's enough about the sidebar. Let's actually start talking about different things that you can add to your map. So the first one I want to talk about is Placemark. And Placemark is kind of the number one uh, sort of visual aid that you're going to go ahead and place on your maps. So when you add a Placemark, it's going to show up with this name being Untitled Placemark, and you're going to have the generic yellow thumbtack. So the text here, or the label, um, we can go ahead and rename this to be maybe a Hotel. Underneath that, we also have the Latitude and Longitude for the Placemark. So if I drag my place mark around by clicking here inside this yellow bounding box, you can tell that I'm changing the coordinates. Now this is a two-way street. I can go ahead and drag it around and see the coordinates change over here. Or if I know the exact coordinates, I can type those in through the latitude and the longitude, and my place mark will jump to those coordinates. This comes in handy if you know um, exactly where something like a wildfire is. You can just type in the coordinates, and your place mark will go right there. If I want to change this uh, icon, I can go ahead and come over here and press my yellow thumbtack. And that gives me all the different icons that come loaded with Google Earth. Now, maybe I want to work with one that's not loaded. I can actually add a custom icon by pressing add a custom icon. I can browse to my desktop or some part of my computer where I have an icon stored. So in this case, I happen to have this babysitter poster, so I'm going to go ahead and use this instead and it adds it to my icon panel here, as well as changes it on my place mark. I can also go ahead and change the color. So maybe I want to go with something more like a uh, peachy color. Press OK, and it kind of gives this sort of peach tint to my place mark. I can also increase the scale by highlighting the text and then using my 10 keypad or my upper number keys and just pressing a number like two, or I could use the little arrows over here to also change that. And if I wanted to make my place mark, or my place mark, I uh, wanted to make my icon more opaque or more transparent, I could lower the opacity over here, maybe something like 85. If I didn't want to have an icon, I could also go ahead and press no icon, or I could change my opacity to be zero. Now, one thing to note about custom icons is whenever you close out of Google Earth Pro, the custom icon does not get saved with the program. So when you relaunch Google Earth, you would have to go ahead and manually re-import these icons back into the application. I'm going to go ahead and put my opacity back to 100. And we're going to press OK. Under Style and Color, we kind of have some similar options in terms of changing the icon color, scale, and opacity. But we can also do the same thing with the label. So I changed the icon scale to be 2. So I'm also going to change the label text to be 2. 
under view, the latitude and longitude here. And then we have things such as range, heading, and tilt. And basically what that's telling you is the view that you have looking at your place mark. Think that you're looking through the lens of a camera at this map. As I pan around, nothing seems to be changing right here. My heading and my tilt doesn't change. The reason why it didn't change is whenever I add a place mark to my screen, whatever view I have looking through my camera at this map is going to determine the range, the heading, and the tilt that the place mark is going to have. So this isn't really affecting so much the place mark itself as it is affecting your view of the place mark. So if I wanted to go ahead and make this current view be my default view for this place mark, what I could do is I could go ahead and press snapshot current view and watch what happens over here. You can tell that it updated some of the latitude and longitude, but it also updated the range and the heading. I didn't see the tilt change too much, so we're not going to worry about that. But when I go ahead and press OK, and I kind of change my camera view around, when I double click on this place mark again, watch what happens. It's going to go back to that view that I just told it to adopt. So that's kind of an important feature to understand with Google Earth Pro is you can have different place marks or polygons or paths with different views. So when you're doing something like a tour, you can just go ahead and click from one place mark and double click on another and your view will change if the view is different. One thing I've noticed is when I add this place mark to my map over here, I didn't put it inside of, inside of my tutorial folder here under places. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And whenever I add another place mark, it should automatically default to putting it under this folder. Another way you can also do your snapshot view is just right clicking and pressing snapshot view here. Um, it literally does the same thing. So you don't have to go back into get info and then find view and then do snapshot view. You can just do snapshot view over here. And last but not least, we have altitude. And basically what altitude is saying is at what point do you want your icon to be, or at what point do you want your place mark to be in relation to the ground? In other words, do you pretty much want it to be standing up off the ground? Do you want it to be raised above the ground? So right now mine is clamped to ground. I can change this to be clamped to seafloor and nothing really seemed to happen. I could also do relative to ground. And then I can go ahead and come down here and change my ground. So I can actually increase the altitude so that it's kind of just floating above this uh, hotel. It's floating above the landscape here. I can do extend path to ground and it adds this line here too, um, which kind of is a neat feature if you wanted to highlight a particular area. I mean, I wanted to highlight this as being a historic hotel or something. I could have my place mark be on top of it. And I could have a line Pretty much pointing directly down at the hotel. So maybe we'll do something like 25 meters. And uh, if I go over to style and color, we can see that I've added now this line, which is this very thin white line here. And I can change the width of this to be like 15. We can also change the color to kind of be this sort of same peachy color. And I can even drop the opacity down to be something like 65. Now as I zoom out, you can tell I've got this hotel with the line pointing down directly at the hotel. I'm actually going to go ahead and turn this off because I really don't want that. And this raises a really good point. Uh, as soon as I went ahead and changed this back to clamp to ground, uh, my place mark went ahead and dropped inside of this building. Remember, I've got 3D buildings checked. So whenever I add a place mark to my scene, if it coincides the same area as a 3D building or as a tree or something, it is going to be obscured. It pretty much is inside the building in this case. So I can go ahead and drag this out of it and we can see it here. So think of your place mark icon as being also a 3D object, but on the flip side, your text or label is not a 3D object. So even though you may have your icon be obscured by a building, the text and label will not be obscured. It's a little weird to think about at first, 
but eventually it will make sense. Just kind of think of one being 3D and the other being sort of 2D, but linked to the 3D object. You're probably thinking, what? This makes no sense. Bear with me. <laughs> so I'm actually going to go ahead and put my place mark just back down here. Actually, I kind of liked it sort of floating above it, so I'm going to go ahead and do that again. Just kind of have it flying in the air. I usually don't do place marks like this, but maybe, maybe I'll start doing it. It looks kind of cool. Uh, anyways, so that's place marks in a nutshell. The next option we have are being able to add polygons. And polygons are good for being able to highlight a area. So in this case, we're going to pretend that we want to highlight this uh, construction site next to the hotel. So as soon as I click on polygons, we'll notice that my cursor icon has changed to being these sort of crosshairs. And it's basically telling me that I'm in drawing mode. And there's two ways you can draw with your polygon. One is you can click along, and you'll notice I'm creating all these different points that are connected by lines. And as soon as I start going down this direction, we can tell that I've got this sort of white blob between all the lines. So points connected by lines. When you stitch enough lines and points together at certain angles, you create an area. And the area is this white blob that is inside of the points and lines. So this is one way of drawing, is just uh, clicking along. And the other way you can draw is you can just click and hold down your cursor. And this is a really good way of drawing if you want to create very specific shapes. So in this case, let's pretend that I uh, don't want to include this uh, debris pile over here, so I'm just going to draw around it, make it something like that. Now we can tell as I was drawing down here on the bottom side that I kind of got some of these uh, points that are sort of, that are just kind of not aligned with the rest of them. I have two options. One is I can move them back so that they fit up here, or the other thing is I can delete them. So to move a point is pretty easy. What you do is you have your cursor over and you can, you can see that's changed to being this sort of Mickey finger. It looks like the hand of Mickey Mouse. And I can just drag my point back up into alignment and then let go. The other thing you do is you go and delete a point. And the way you do that is you would left click to select it and then right click and it's deleted. So again, that's left click to select it and then right click to delete it. Okay, so I've got this polygon here, and I'm gonna go ahead and rename this polygon because I don't really like untitled polygon. I'm gonna call this construction site. And whenever I rename something in a polygon, you'll notice that there does that there's no actual label for the polygon on the screen. This is pretty much just so you know what it is when you look over here in your places panel. So I'm going to go ahead and change my area color to be something like this construction orange. And I'm also going to go ahead and change my line color, because right now you can tell I've kind of got this white stroke on the outside. Those are my lines. I'm going to change this to be also the same orange color. And I'll drop the opacity down, I'll make it be 65, 65. Uh, and if I wanted, I could also go up to my lines width, and I could change this to be something like 25. And you can tell that I kind of got this thicker stroke now on the outside. I'm not necessarily a big fan of that, so I'm going to change it back to being one. So this is an instance where I would change my altitude. When we look at my uh, polygon, we can tell that a number of different features are rising up through it. They're poking through the polygon. I've got a couple piles here. I've got some tractors and construction equipment. I've got some little construction buildings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this from being clamped to ground to relative to ground. You're thinking, wait a minute, that looks even worse. So what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and change the altitude. So we'll do something like six meters. And now I literally have this blob just kind of flying above my construction site. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and press extend size to ground. Now we have this 3D polygon that's highlighting the entire area. There's actually a little bit of something poking through over here, so I'm going to raise this up. Let's try 12 meters. That's a little too high. Let's try 8 meters. 
That looks better. Got a little bit of some extrusion over here with this tree butting in, but I'm not too worried about that. So this looks pretty good. So I'm actually going to go ahead and leave this alone. And then we have measurements. Measurements are kind of cool because they tell you exactly how big the area is. The perimeter in this case is 0.40 uh, miles. And you can change this too if you want to be uh, square miles. Or not square miles, I'm sorry. If you want to do nautical miles or feet or yards or something. And if I wanted to go ahead and have an icon over here that said construction site, what I could do is I could add a place mark. And if I zoom in here, you can tell that, oops, gotta put my place mark over here. We can tell that uh, my place mark is going to be hidden by this. So if I do zoom in too close, my uh, icon will be hidden. So what I'm actually going to do in this case is I'm just going to go ahead and press no icon. And I'm just going to have this text here. And one thing to know is whenever you do no icon, you can't move your text around anymore because uh, in order to move the place mark, you have to have an icon to play, position around. So maybe I want to go ahead and position this text because I really want it more up here. What I can do is I can add an icon back, position my text over here, then press no icon, and that looks pretty good. I'll just recall this. Uh, Rename this the construction site. Go right at two. So that's pretty good. So let's pretend that this construction site is also affecting this road up here. And there's going to be some road delays up here. And I want to highlight this road. And what I can use is the path tool. Path tool is pretty cool. It functions a lot like the polygon tool, except that it doesn't highlight an area. It's really useful for highlighting things such as roads or a future bridge or where a wall is going to go, something like that. So like the polygon tool, it also gives me the uh, drawing, also puts me into drawing mode. So I'm just going to kind of click along here. And oops, I really got some of these points uh, out of order. See, this one's really far skew. I'm not sure what happened there. There we go. Looks better. And I'll just call this uh, road delay path. Um, I'm really a big fan of naming what my paths and polygons actually are. If you don't, you're just going to have kind of these sort of untitled polygon one, untitled polygon two, untitled path one over here in your places, and that's kind of confusing. So it's a good habit just to just to go ahead and label what your paths and polygons are so that you do know what they are and you're not like, wait, what was this one for again? <laughs> so under style and color, uh, right now I only have lines available. Um, if I were to extrude this path, I would have uh, area also be available, but because this path is clamped to the ground, I don't get that option yet. And I'm gonna go ahead and change this to be a red color. Um, I'm also gonna change the width from being one to something like, let's try 25. And I'll also drop the opacity down so that we can actually see through it. I'm going to change the altitude. I'm going to do something to, I'm going to change it to relative to ground. And we're going to raise it up a couple meters. And let's try six. So now it's just kind of floating above our earth here. And I'm going to go ahead and press extend path to ground. And we get an area added to our path. And the area color right now is white, even though it looks black. And the reason why it is that is the, uh, if you think of the sun being in the sky and it's looking down onto our path, uh, the area is covered up, so it's showing up in the shadow, and that's why it looks dark like this. Um, you can change the color to be red or something if you wanted, but you're going to notice that it doesn't change on your screen. So normally what I do then is I just go over to opacity and just drop it down to 65 and uh, just call it good. And also kind of like the polygon under measurements, it tells you the length of how much you've highlighted with your path. So in this case, just 0.26 miles. Our next option is being able to add a image overlay. And in this tutorial, I'm not gonna touch too much on how that works. Um, in part two, we're going to go ahead and actually kind of fo focus on a real-world example of where we're going to highlight a state park. 
and kind of show you how that process works. So in this case, I'm just kind of skip over this one, but uh, just know if you, if you wanted to add an image overlay, this is the button you would need to click on. So the next option we have is Tour, and Tour is kind of part one of making a uh, anime movie. You would need to go ahead and record a tour, and then you have to go into Movie Maker and find your tour, and then render that tour out. So Tour is pretty basic. The way it works is you're going to go ahead and press it, and then to go and actually start your tour, you're going to press the record button. And the tour is going to record any actions you make on your screen, any movement that is actually. So right now we can tell that my camera is kind of panning around and stuff. And then I'm going to stop it and I'm going to go ahead and click on my hotel place mark. And it's going to go to the snapshot view for my hotel. And then if I were to press the hotel again, it's going to go back to this hotel view, even though the camera was already there and nothing moved, the tour is going to record that as being, quote unquote, a movement. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let's play it back. And we can tell this is me manually moving my camera around. And the tour is recording that because it's recording movement. Now this is when I clicked on the hotel place mark and went to that snapshot view. And then at the very end is when I clicked the hotel place mark again and even though the camera was already there and there wasn't any discernible movement on the screen, uh, Google Earth still records it as being camera movement. Even though the camera was already at the position, it still will record it. This is kind of a way of being able to cheat the system and give yourself that extra pad at the end of video. So maybe you don't want to change the last view for the last 20 seconds of your animation. You could just go ahead and find the place mark that you're already at for that location, double click it again after 20 seconds, and you've given yourself that extra pad at the end. If you're confused, don't worry. Part two, we're going to talk more about this and you actually see it a couple more examples of how that works. So to uh, save a tour, you're just going to press the little floppy disk over here. And I can call this uh, Hotel Pan. I'll just call this Hotel Camera Pan. I'm going to press OK. My tour also gets saved under my tutorial folder in places, which is kind of cool. Then I'm going to close out of tour mode. So this is kind of the main five buttons that you're going to use in your uh, edit panel. Uh, you also have a couple or your tools panel. There's a couple other options to know about that also come in handy. The first one is being able to show historical imagery. So in this case, me, I want to show a map of this area from a couple years ago. What I could do is I could go ahead and go back to one of these earlier years. We want to see what it was like in 2000. And uh, we go, wow, we could tell there was no hotel, there was no nothing. Um, there's not even a road over here pretty much. <laughs> So, and I could use one of these maps to go ahead and work with. Um, apparently they didn't have color photography back then. <laughs> so that's how historical imagery works. The next thing is showing uh, real daylight. And what I mean by that is it's looking at the position of the sun in relation to the time. And it's going to go ahead and show what the shadows and the lighting would look like at that point. I don't think this works on like cloudy days and stuff or if it's snowing or anything like that. I don't think it takes that into account, the actual weather. I think it just looks at, okay, here's the position of the sun in relation to where you are at this point in the day. So if I want to go back to what it was like earlier today, maybe like in the morning, I could scroll back in time to, uh, you know, what it was like at 7.04. And I could record my map using the sunlight at using the position of the sun at what it was like at 7.04. Next we have is the uh, planet icon. And maybe we didn't want to do a Google Earth. We wanted to do like a Google Sky or Google Mars or Moon or something. You could also do that. Um, I really have never had a need to actually make a map for the Mars, uh, for Mars or Moon. But if you wanted to, this is how you would do it. The next option we have is the ruler. 
And the ruler comes in handy if you're just trying to go ahead and find out, you know, from point A to point B, how far is that? You know, is it two miles, is it six miles? Um, this comes in handy. Sometimes you may get a map request from a producer or somebody else in the news department being like, hey, there was a fire two miles west of Tumalo Mountain. Can you go ahead and map that for me? And then you just go up to your ruler, find Tumalo Mountain, and then just draw a line two miles west, and you can put your fire icon in there or something. Uh, one thing to note between line and path is line is only going to allow you to do two points. So lately you're just going to have point A and point B, and you can't draw any more. If you wanted to go ahead and draw more, then you need to use the path tool where you can then go ahead and draw multiple different lines on your screen. And you could also go ahead and save these so they would show up over here under your places too. If you want to go ahead and email this map view, you could go ahead and do that. If you want to print it out, you could print it. Um, if you want to save this as a still, you could press the save image. And one thing to know about save image is you also kind of get a, a header over here and a legend as well as the compass and the uh, scale. So I usually don't work with the title or the legend on. Um, I usually do leave the scale and the compass on. I think they're kind of handy. And if you want to use this maybe for Camula Asset Manager, so we could put this in a full screen, you will want to change the resolution to be 1920 by 1080. And you press save image. And I might just save this my raw media. I'll just call this uh, the location. One thing to note, when you do save a still out of Google Earth Pro, it is going to save it as a JPEG. So when, before you upload it into Cameo Asset Manager, you will need to convert that JPEG to a PNG. And the last option you have is going to Google Maps. Uh, if you want to view this area in Google Maps, you just press that. And that's going to go ahead and launch it in Google Chrome. Um, I actually just launched it on my other screen that you can't see, but that's what, that's what Viewer Maps does. So before I let you guys go, uh, one other thing I want to mention um, a couple of other tools that don't show up in the toolbar. Uh, one is Movie Maker. And Movie Maker is kind of part two of making an animated movie. And you just go up to Tools and press Movie Maker. And then you would find the tool that you want and then uh, you would render it out. Um, we'll cover more about the render settings in part two. Um, for right now, just kind of know that Tools Movie Maker is where it's stored. And then the other thing to note too is to go in find your preferences. Um, on a Mac, you just go up to Google Earth Pro and then press Preferences. On a PC, it's going to be under Tools, and you're going to have something called Options, and you're just going to click on that. So, Preferences is useful um, in that it has your fly-to speed. And basically, the fly-to speed determines how quickly you're going to go ahead and fly to a, uh, fly to a place mark view or a polygon view or anything like that. If you want it to go really fast, you can change this to be a higher number. If you want it to go slower, you can make it even go slower. I usually find 0.2500 is a pretty good speed. Not too fast, not too slow, but you can mess around with that if you want to. And then last but not least is the cache. Um, I usually find this being more of a problem with Macs than with PCs, but sometimes when I'm trying to render out of Google Earth Pro, I find the render process is really, really slow. And one thing I've done to go ahead and speed up the render is to go ahead and purge the cache before beginning a render. And I just go ahead and purge both the disk cache as well as the memory cache. All right, so that pretty much does it for part one of this two-part series. Part two, we're going to go ahead and take some of the knowledge that we learned in this tutorial, and we're going to apply it to a couple different real-world examples so that it... Um, kind of makes even more sense as to how the program works and how you add place marks and things like that and render out tours and all that fun stuff. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below or shoot me, a, shoot me a message. As always, thanks again for watching. Until next time, take it easy.